Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy, busy schedules to join us in today's webinar focusing on combating microaggressions in the workplace. Our speaker is Dr. Shindale Seal. Um, I have a nice introduction about her for those of you who don't know her, haven't had the pleasure of interacting with her. Before we get to that, um, I did want to take care of a few things. Uh, first and foremost, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Dr. Mayan Zowatuk, and I am the Director of Program and Partner Development at the UC Santa Cruz Silicon Valley Extension in Santa, Santa Clara, California. Um, Monica, can we go ahead and have you go to the next screen? So before we get started on our webinar, I wanted to make sure to share some really fun information. Um, my team and I have been working super, super hard to expand our diversity, equity, and inclusion academic offerings at Extension to everyone nationally, in California, across the globe. Um, these offerings are available for you. You don't have to necessarily be affiliated with our main campus to take these offerings. Um, with that being said, one of our very first new DEI courses is the Introduction to Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, developed and taught by Dr. Shindale Steele. We are having this course to be open for enrollment. You can go in and enroll in this course or recommend it to others. It's going to be offered on Saturdays, four Saturdays, starting January 23rd and going through February 13th. Um, on those Saturdays, it's going to be delivered via the live online format from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. I believe that's Pacific Standard Time. The other fun thing that we've been working on is um, our new diversity, and equity, diversity, equity, and inclusion series page. So we have Monica click on that link and show you what else that we've been up to. So as I mentioned, we have been working super, super hard to expand our offerings in the DEI space. Once we have our courses approved, you will start to see them populate this page. So as we scroll down in the page, you can see that we have um, several courses in the pipeline, uh, specifically the intro to DEI course. Uh, we recently have the uh, cultural equity for student success course approved and we are almost finished finalizing the DEI for the C-suite course. So these are some courses that are in the pipeline. Uh, we also thankfully have several courses that currently exist in our open for enrollment um, that are associated with DEI and those are under the other related DEI courses that you can see there. And um, what I want to kind of segue to there is not only do we have course opportunities for you, if you are someone who wants to reskill or upskill into the DEI space, we also have teaching opportunities for those of you who have the interest and the expertise to teach for us. And so um, what I would like for you to do, Monica, is if you can go to our Join Our Instructor page, perfect. So this is the page that we have dedicated on our website to connect with those people who have backgrounds and expertise and interest and passion to teach for us. Um, as we scroll down the page, what you'll notice is that uh, this, this page is currently reflecting uh, the current instructor openings that we have available in technology, education, and bioscience. Um, but I'm pretty sure that a lot of you have um, careers either in these industries specifically, um, but also intersection, intersecting with DEI. And so this page will be updated to reflect our DEI uh, course offerings. Uh, what I do wanna share with you just verbally is that if you are someone who has the interest and expertise to teach with us, um, specifically for a uh, DEI for C-suite course, please uh, fill out this form. Specifically, you'll do that by, if you scroll down a little bit, um, if you click on the apply today button, it'll take you to our smart sheet. This is where we're requesting that you fill in your information. This data will then go to my team and I, and I will sift through it. And if we find a match, we will definitely make contact with you um, and see how we can get our partnership started. Um, additionally, if you are someone who has interest and expertise in the intersection of DEI and AI, artificial intelligence, we are heavily recruiting instructors for courses that we have in the pipeline for that content area. Also, if you are someone who has expertise and interest for DEI for activists, DEI for different um, uh, identity groups, um, for protected classes, 
please, please reach out to us uh, in addition to DEI for sustainability. So lots of fun things happening. Do not feel shy to reach out to us. Monica will be providing the attendees in this chat with the two links that we've just gone through. So she'll be providing the DEI series page link for you. That way you can sign up and get notified once our courses are available for enrollment. And she'll also share the join our instructor team link for you as well. For those of you who have the interest in at this point with COVID-19 bandwidth to teach with us, we definitely look forward to hearing from you. So with that being said, I would like to switch gears and introduce you to someone that I have had the pleasure of interacting with. And I'm going to be completely honest, I was stalking her on LinkedIn because <laughs> I was looking for someone who was already in the DEI space offering content that was true to speaking truth to power regarding diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I had the fortune to come across Dr. Shindale Seal and I reached out to her. She reached back out to me. We were able to strike up some conversation. Uh, she has since been a critical piece to growing our diversity, equity, and inclusion offerings. So with that, I'm gonna provide an introduction. So in two decades of leadership and training roles, Dr. Shindale Seal has focused on business performance optimization, staff development, and the creation of sustainable and equitable working environments in corporate, academic, and nonprofit arenas. She provides academic, professional, and quality of life resources to marginalized members of South Los Angeles through her nonprofit organization, Our Community Mentors. Her research and consulting through her company, Speed Coaching for Consulting, for consulting focuses on creating equitable solutions in gender, race, age, and ability matters, and has led to her being a sought after subject matter expert and speaker. Dr. Seal holds a doctorate in organizational change and leadership, a master's degree in education from the University of Southern California, and she has earned a bachelor's degree that focused on language and linguistics from CSU Dominguez Hills. She teaches at the University of Redlands and also at the UCSD Silicon Valley Extension, where she is also the inaugural program chair for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you, Dr. Shindale Seal. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> that was awesome. I, uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, to spend this time with you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for taking this time to, to learn a little bit about some of the things that you have seen and experienced uh, in your workplace and probably in your social circles, uh, what we call microaggression. So we're going to get started honor your time so that we can um, learn really quickly. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to there we go. All right. So like I said, thanks so much uh, for joining us. If you um, feel the, the urge, please, please, please hit us in the chat. Let us know what you're thinking. Let us know what you're feeling. Um, I'm probably going to be asking you a lot. Hey, tell me yes, tell me no, tell me whatever. Uh, so please feel free uh, to, to communicate with us and to engage, okay? All right, so in this session, we are going to be discussing where microaggressions come from. What are they? Like, who are the targets? Uh, who's on the receiving end? What a microaggression looks like? How to combat it as a target? And unfortunately, how to mitigate it as a perpetrator? Then um, we'll do, of course, a Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat as we go along. Uh, and Monica will capture as, as we're uh, progressing. Um, I do want for you, before we get started, uh, to hit me in the chat. Let me know, you know, where you're coming from, uh, where, where you out, where you are. Um, are you, I'm in LA, are you in New York? Are you in, you know, Saudi Arabia, wherever you are, hit us up, let us know what's going on. Okay. So as you're doing that, many of us have heard the term microaggression. Uh, truth be told, most people don't really know what they are, but honestly, they're everywhere. They're at your church, they're at your work, they're at your school, they're in your grocery store, they're everywhere. They act as a, or a pervasive social ill that we've all seen and we've all committed. 
um, but we really don't know what the origins or the impact has been. So uh, we hear tossed around a lot in diversity circles. Um, we, we hear it in like, you know, conversations. We hear it when we're in HR and, and you know, we're being talked to, but few of us really know what the term means. Microaggression was coined by Dr. Chester Pierce in 1970. It is defined as brief and common daily verbal behavioral and environmental communications, whether intentional or unintentional, that transmit hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to a target person because they belong to a stigmatized group. And what are these stigmatized groups? Although not an exhaustive list, here are the categories or targets we'll be covering in our conversation. As with all instances of discrimination or microaggression, people are mistreated for characteristics they have absolutely no control over. In this case, it's gender. So let's look at some interpretations of the term. So first of all, gender could be either of two sexes, male or female, especially when considered uh, with reference to the social and cultural uh, differences. It could also be a, a range of characteristics that may include biological sex. Um, that's, you know, the state of being male or female or intersex. And now there are a lot of cultures uh, that use a, a gender binary, like, you know, boys, men, uh, girls, uh, women. Uh, but those who exist outside of these groups fall in an umbrella non-binary term, which is like, you know, non-binary gender queer. And some societies have specific genders besides man and woman, such as the hijras of South Asia. So there, there are several genders, not just um, what we have become uh, socialized with. Now, the origin of this term um, is interesting. It, it, the, the distinction of uh, between biological sex and gender as a role was introduced by John Money in 1954. The meaning of the word gender did not become widespread until the 70s when feminist theory embraced the concept distinguishing biological sex and the social construct of gender. Much like race, gender is a social construct and it stipulates that gender roles are an achieved status in a social environment, which implicitly and explicitly character, uh, ca categorize people and motivate social behaviors. So basically, society has enacted behaviors associated with the binary group, men, women. And because of this, many of us follow suit and conform to those behaviors. Now these encompass a range of behaviors and attitudes that are generally considered acceptable, appropriate, or desirable for a person based on that person's biological or perceived sex, which brings us to the impetus for our conversation today. So I want you to hit me in the chat um, with your responses to these prompts, right? So these are perceptions, gender perceptions. I want you to, to think about um, when you learned about what women do. So what is it that a woman does? What have you been taught that a woman does? Hit me in the chat, let me know what you think. What is it that women are? Go ahead, are, you know, are they rough and tough or are they gentle and kind, okay? What, what thoughts do you have? Same for men. Let me know what men do what men are, what have you been taught? What have you been socialized to believe? All right, the chat's blowing up, nice, okay. The, those are the perceptions that influence your uh, social constructs of gender, okay? Whatever you've been taught that a woman does, whatever a woman is, what a man does, what he is, that's the social construct. Now, along these lines, this construction happens very, very early. Most children learn to uh, categorize themselves by gender by the age of three. Three years old, we start learning what girls do, what boys do. From birth in the course of gender socialization, children learn gender stereotypes and roles from their parents and the environment. Now, there are several types of microaggression, but here are the three types of gender microaggression. We've got our sexual objectification, assumptions of traditional gender roles, and assumptions of inferiority. And we're going to flesh those out just a little bit here. So sexual objectification. Now this is the act of treating a person solely as an object of sexual desire, as a commodity, or so forth. Okay, that's when you're objectifying someone. And it could be male or female. 
or it could be any other gender, okay? Then we have uh, the assumptions of traditional gender roles. Now, this is where we're expected to act and speak and dress and groom ourselves and conduct ourselves based on our assigned sex. So girls dress like this, boys dress like this. Girls wear dresses, boys do not, okay? That's our gender roles and, and, and how we conduct ourselves and present ourselves. Then we have our, our assumptions of inferiority. Now, a major plank of early evolutionary theory was a the belief that women were intellectually and physically inferior to men. So female inferiority uh, was a logical conclusion of the Darwinian world. So this stems from the time humans have traced themselves, right? So we've got divisions of labor based on sex and assumptions of inferiority based on gender. So this is where this particular assumption derived. So let's look at some examples of sexist or gendered microaggression. I want you to hit me in the chat if you've seen any of this, even if you've done any of it, but there's no judgment here. You just go ahead and tell me. Have you ever experienced catcalling on the street? Hey, baby, what's your name? Any of that? Hit me in the chat. Yes, no, maybe so, okay? How about women being told that they need to have a husband to be happy? Anybody heard that? All right. What about men refusing to wash dishes because it's woman's work or, or refusing to do any of that housework stuff because it's woman's work? Anybody experienced that, heard that, done that? Hit me in the chat with a yes. How about how about those stay-at-home dads, right? Who decide, no, I really want, you know, paternity leave. I want to take care of my kid, my newborn. And they're, they're made fun of. Anybody ever seen that? How about making unwanted sexual advances toward another person, regardless of their gender? Or denying a person an academic or professional opportunity because of their gender? Yeah. Okay. These seem pretty common, pretty common. Okay, I want you to put that under your hat. We're gonna move on to race. Race is a grouping of humans based on shared physical or social qualities into categories generally viewed as distinct by society. These characteristics we can detect by sight or touch, okay? Now, a little bit of background. Prior to the 16th century, race was used to refer to speakers of a common language, then to denote national affiliations. But by the 17th century, the term race shifted from a linguistic or national distinction to referring to physical, phenotypical traits. So the current concept of race, the one that we know now, along with many of the ideas now associated with the term, arose at the time of the scientific revolution. So let's spend a little bit of time investigating these ideas associated with race. So there are ideas that individuals, and just walk with me here, individuals belonging to certain groups have distinct behaviors and capacities which are believed to be deeply ingrained. I'll read that, I, 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 let's, let's revisit that. There are beliefs that certain groups that have distinct behaviors and capacities, that, that they have, you know, they behave in certain ways. And during the 17th century, a combination of folklore, sketchy science and European conquest contributed to beliefs that linked inherited physical differences between groups to inherited intellectual, behavioral and moral qualities. Now, what does this mean? In the world does this mean? It means that people took on the beliefs that basically said that a person who looks like this acts like this. Currently, we see it manifesting in implicitly and sometimes explicitly exhibited behaviors. Now, I must reiterate that race has no biological meaning, none at all. So these categories are simply uh, social constructs that we use to segment people based on their perceived shared characteristics. Now, I want you to hit me in the chat with a yes. If you've ever heard at any time in your life what I'm describing here, anything that even remotely sounds like a statement attributing behaviors to physical characteristics. Well, don't you know that these people act like this? Well, everybody knows that these people 
do these types of things. Attribution, okay? Hit me in the chat if, you, if you've ever experienced that. All right, now, there are three types of racial microaggression. We've got the microassault. So this is an explicit racial derogation, right? This could be verbal or nonverbal and expresses itself in name calling and avoidant behavior or purposeful discriminatory actions. Then we've got the micro insult, right? Now this is communication that conveys rudeness or insensitivity and it demeans a person's racial heritage or identity. Now these are those quasi snubs, you know, that you hear or whatnot. Then we've got the micro invalidation. Now, this is communication that excludes, it negates, or it nullifies the psychological thoughts, feelings, or experiences of a person belonging to a particular group. Now, I want you to imagine. You go to your supervisor at work and you say, hey, these people are telling these, you know, off-color racial jokes. And your supervisor says to you, ah, you're all right. No one got hurt. I mean, it, it's okay. Thicken up. That's the micro-invalidation. All right, let's look at some examples. Anybody ever heard this? You are a credit to your race. Hit me in the chat if you've heard that one. Now, what's the translation there? It is unusual for someone of your race to be intelligent or to have achieved this accomplishment reserved for the dominant race. All right, so yeah, I see that some of you have experienced this. Okay, you're a credit to your race. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. All right, next. There's only one race, the human race. Anybody heard that one? Anybody heard that one? Hit me in the chat. Okay, what's the translation? I'm just gonna deny your racial cultural identity because you know what? It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, okay, yeah, we've heard that one. There's only one race, the human race. Next, clutching the purse or the wallet or crossing the street as a black or Latino approaches or passes. Translation, you people are criminals. Anybody ever had that happen to them? Mm hmm yes, yes. Oh yeah, our store owners following a customer of color around. What's that translation? I think you're gonna steal, so I need to keep my eye on you. Mm hmm anybody experienced that one? Or anybody, anybody ever seen it? All right, and no doubt, no doubt. We've all heard, why do you people have to be so loud and animated? Just calm down. Or, or on the flip side, why do you people have to be always so quiet? Cat got your tongue, right? Translation, you need to assimilate to the dominant culture's communication style so I can feel comfortable. People of color get this a lot. All right. Let's move on. The people with disabilities. Now, the CDC estimates that around 61 million adults in the United States live with a disability. Now, of these adults, one in three have unmet health care needs. 63% are unemployed, and many, many others have unaddressed mental health issues. So we define ability, discrimination, and microaggression as discrimination and social prejudice against people with disabilities or who, have, who are perceived to have disabilities. It characterizes people as defined by their disabilities and as inferior to the non-disabled. And although many of us, many of us, no doubt, are well-meaning, we end up saying things and behaving in ways that can be characterized as microaggression. And here are some of the examples of disability microaggressions. And like before, I want you to hit me in the chat if you've seen some of these. Deciding for others how bad their disability is or isn't. Phrases like, but you look so normal. I don't see anything wrong with you, right? Who's seen that? All right. What about this one? assuming that disability always means inability. News flash: people with disabilities can do a host of things. Sports, self-care, sex, feed themselves, write, read, work, anything. People with disabilities can do these things, all right? Oh, how about the belittling? Now this can be anything from ignoring a person with disabilities in a conversation to directly mimicking 
the person's disability. We see this in a lot of like high school stuff and sadly in workplaces, if they actually do manage to hire somebody with a disability, right? Anybody seen any of this? All right, how about this one here? Assuming that disability is a negative trait, it isn't, it isn't. Let's get that in our heads. Disability is not a negative trait. It is a part of a person's identity and it is a part of their, dis their diversity, all right? So a lot of us though assume this, we assume a deficit perception, okay? And this one here, I will raise my hand and admit I have done this. And I know that many of us do this on a regular basis. We turn uh, disabilities into minor everyday defects. How many of you have said something like, oh my gosh, I am so OCD. And when we're talking about someone who, you know, may be having a moment, oh, he's so bipolar. Uh-huh, yeah. And how many of us have used the R word? You are retarded, yeah. Mm -hmm. So remember, when we say things like this, we turn disabilities into minor everyday defects and we are all guilty. We're all guilty, all right. All right, that chat's blowing up, thank you. All right, now we wanna talk about able privilege a little bit. We're still on the same, uh, still in the same section here. It's a gnarly little thing, able privilege. Now, what is able privilege? I'm gonna ask you a few questions. This is our, this is our rubric. Can you get inside all of the buildings that you try to enter through the main entrance? Hit me in the chat with a yes or hit me in the chat with a no. Can you get inside all of the buildings you try to get into through the main entrance? If you answer yes, you have able privilege. How about your neighborhood? Is your neighborhood accessible to you? without you know, any type of boundaries or movement uh, restrictions. Is your entire neighborhood accessible to you? If you answer yes, able privilege. How about shopping? Can you go shopping alone without appropriate accommodations? Folks, if you've answered yes to any of these questions, you've got just a little bit of able privilege, okay? All right, now let's turn to sexual orientation microaggression. Now, homosexual and gender variant individuals were among uh, indigenous peoples of the Americas prior to the European colonization. In East Asia, uh, same-sex love has actually been referred to since the earliest recorded history. And we've seen same-sex relationships in ancient Greece, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and several other parts of the world. Yet, 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 yet. Within the last few hundred years, many governments and, uh, have sought to restrict and exclude LGBTQ plus members from full citizenship. Now, though the Supreme Court legalized same-sex marriage in 2015 and just recently expanded LGBTQ plus rights by prohibiting employers from terminating people based on their sexual orientation, many forms of discrimination still exist for members of the LGBTQ uh, community. Injustices, they run the gamut. They run the gamut with many experiencing sexual orientation microaggression on a regular basis. So sexual orientation microaggression can be expressed in, in these ways here. And let's go through them one by one. Erasure of identity. All right, hit me in, up in the chat if you've heard people debating or denying a person's sexual identity or orientation through a religious lens. Oh, God does not condone this. Or scientific, well, that's not, you know, look at how the animals mate. Yes, that's one too. Or just even their personal lens. I, I just basically don't believe it. Okay, that's the erasure of identity. How many of you seen that? All right. I see some of you experience that. How about the assumptions of pathology? Now, this is the assumption that members of the LGBTQ plus community are deviants. If you're gay, you're, that's, you're, you're a deviant, you, ugh, you're a divergent type of thought, whatever, okay? Yeah, you've heard that, okay. How about derogatory language? These are times when people use terms or phrases that are insulting and, and, and derogatory and, and just meant to make people feel horrible, right? 
Okay, we've seen some of that. This is an interesting one, the expectation of gender conformity. Now, this could be saying something like, why can't you just act straight? Or, or um, you know, I, I, I wish you would just stop being such a tomboy. I mean, you know, you're a girl. Yeah, okay, yeah, it seems like we've seen some of that. How about the assumption of the universal LGBTQ plus experience? Now, this is the assumption that all members of the community share the same perspective. It's like, hey, you know what, you're gay. Tell me what your thoughts are on this. Because, you know, because every single gay person thinks the same. All right, yeah, all right. Seems like we've seen that too. And this is a particularly gnarly one. Incorrect pronoun usage. Now, this is when you refuse to use a requested pronoun. Now, I say requested pronoun. Um, based on your personal perception. Now, I see you as a woman, so I'm just going to say she. Even though I've told you that I wanted them day, you're still using she, okay? That's incorrect pronoun usage. Now, these are just some of the microaggressions leveled against members of the LGBTQ plus community. And these are, th this is what people bring to work every day, okay? All right, let's move on to age microaggression. Now, the multi-generational workforce is a term used to describe the five generational cohorts in the workplace today, five of them. And here we can see that breakdown, okay? Just peruse it a little bit. Now, the convergence of these various age groups in the workplace has been shown to improve organizational performance and upskilling. It's a good thing. Studies also show that productivity in both older and younger workers is higher in companies with mixed age work teams, but, but, but it can also cause a great deal of discord. Why? These groups have different work styles. They have different value systems. And this can result in negative stereotypes about the other generations. This is where microaggressions related to ageism comes in. Now, what is ageism? In 1969, Robert Neal Butler coined the term ageism to describe discrimination against seniors. It was originally about seniors, okay? But in recent times, it's been expanded to include prejudice against children, teenagers, and adults of any age. I have been accused of ageism by my teenager. Let me just go there. Okay. He got grounded, don't worry about it. That's a whole nother conversation, okay? So now let's go through examples of ageism. I want you to hit me in the chat if you've seen any of this. Younger workers being perceived as immature, lazy, entitled, irresponsible, and uncommitted. Who's seen that? Who's heard that? How many of us have done it? Okay, no judgment. How about older workers being perceived as set in their ways and stubborn, out of touch, slow, and technophobic? Who's seen that? How about young people's abilities and skills diminished because of you know, lack of experience? And how many of us have told jokes or heard jokes about older people having difficulty hearing? Hey, grandpa, mm -hmm, we've done that. Walking, oh, you need help across the street or using technology. Okay, we've seen a lot of that going on. And this is what people on any side of the age range experiences, especially the super young or those who are in a more mature age bracket. All right, lastly, let's go into religion. Now, while ideas about religious liberty and tolerance are central to America's founding story, Different religious groups, including Catholics, Jews, Mormons, and Muslims, have suffered discrimination in the United States at various points in history. Now, we know that there are pro prohibitions um, regarding discriminating against individuals based on their religion and hiring, firing, and, and all other terms of um, employment. And most, most, everyone that I can think of, if not all religions, espouse love and acceptance of all people. Yet, we still find increased instances 
of microaggression against people based solely on their religion. So how common are the instances of religious microaggression? Well, I mean, how often could something like this happen to people based on their religion, right? Well, here you go. According to Pew Research Center, these are the reports of religious microaggression and discrimination. And when we add non-religious groups into the mix, atheists reported experiencing the highest incidences of non-religious microaggression and discrimination compared to other non-religious groups. So as we can see, religious discrimination and microaggressions are more prevalent than we think. So these are some of the ways they manifest. I want you to hit me up in the chat if you've seen any of these or done any of these. The endorsing of religious stereotypes. How many of you have heard about the rich Jew or the Muslim terrorist? Hit me in the chat, yes? How about um, the pathology of different religious groups by considering certain religious practices or traditions as abnormal, that's so weird, or sinful, oh, you should never do that, God wouldn't approve, or deviant. Mm -hmm. The assumption of one's religion as the norm. Newsflash, newsflash, stop the presses. Not everyone celebrates Christmas. I'm sorry to have to be the one to tell you, okay? How many have seen this? The assumption of one's religion as the norm. How about the assumption of religious homogeneity? Where you assume that every believer of a religion practice, practices the same customs or has the same beliefs as the entire group. Yeah. Denial of religious prejudice. I really like this one. This one is a great one. Okay, so this is where you claim to respect all religions equally. I respect everyone. You know, God told us that we're supposed to respect everyone equally. But clearly, obviously, undoubtedly, behave otherwise. To some people, these communications may appear harmless, but they are a form of covert racism or everyday discrimination. Because they occur on a regular basis, they can be super stressful and frustrating for people on the receiving end because most perpetrators deny committing them and they are unaware that they're causing harm. They occur frequently. And while this may sound excessive, I know it may sound excessive, I want you to imagine the last microaggression you've seen or experienced or committed. And I want you to multiply that times all the people in the world interacting with one another on a daily basis. Just think about it. The instances of microaggression increase exponentially. And while not everyone experiences microaggression the same, I want you to consider the impact this has on people on the receiving end. And here are some of the reported implications. So, with all of this information, how do we combat these insidious acts? I am so glad you asked. First of all, let's be honest. Dealing with microaggression can be very uncomfortable. But if you find yourself on the receiving end of a microaggression, you have options. You can choose to address it or not, okay? One option experts suggest if you do choose to address it, and if you actually have the opportunity to do so, you can calmly let the perpetrator know how their behavior made you feel. You can educate them in, in describing what was offensive about the microaggression, but be sure to address the behavior and not the perpetrator. So how do we do this? First, you wanna ask for clarification. You could say something like, well, you know, I'm not sure I understand what you just said. Could you, could you clarify? Then you want to acknowledge the intent behind the statement. You could say something like, what, well, what exactly did you mean by what you just said? 
I mean, you really want to get them to explain to you what it is that they said and what they meant. Then you kind of want to separate the intent from the impact. You could say, thanks for letting me know what you intended. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I know that you didn't mean to, but what you said hurt my feelings. Now, granted, this could only work if it's somebody that, you know, you are interacting with um, on a regular basis, someone that you see. Because if it's a total stranger, eh, okay. And, and this is actually where you get to express your feelings in a constructive way by explaining to the perpetrator why their term or phrasing was a poor choice. So, you know, instead of saying, you're a racist or you're a misogynist or you're such a homophobe, it might just be best or more constructive to say the statement or behavior was inappropriate and offensive. Now, if we're the perpetrator of microaggression, as we all have been, I admit to it, there's no judgment here. We can have a range of emotions or reactions to being called out on our behavior. Nobody likes to be, you know, called out. It's natural, but that doesn't mean that you should act on these emotions, okay? So if you truly want to be a more inclusive person, one who values others, one who wants to be valued, you must make yourself accountable. Make yourself accountable for your actions. And here's how you do that. First of all, do not deflect or cast blame. Now it's natural, it's a natural reaction, almost knee jerk. And even if you initially do deflect or cast blame, you must catch yourself and then check your intentions. Reflect to find out why you said what you said. You know, as we all learned, we all have internalized stereotypes and beliefs about others that cause us to commit microaggressions against them. So that after that, what you need to do is ask forgiveness because let's just hands down, regardless of your intentions, someone's feelings were hurt. And whether you intended to or not, whether it was just a joke, whatever. If someone calls you on your actions, unless you know that it was insulting, hurtful, or interpreted as anything negative, just authentically apologize. It doesn't take anything from you. Just apologize, right? And then you want to take a concert, make a concerted effort to become more informed about the way you communicate to people who are different than you. There are too many resources out there for anyone, and I mean anyone, to claim that they didn't know or didn't understand that what they did or said was offensive. We can all avoid microaggression with a good serving of self-reflection, self-awareness, and mutual respect. Thank you all for your time. I'll take any questions that you have. All right. <laughs> clapping, clapping, clapping. So, let's see what we know, So there's a couple of questions that came in the Q&A. Uh -huh. um, but first, I do want to apologize. I, the chat was disabled, and so we did that a little bit later. Okay. Um, and so people were responding in the Q&A. Okay, um, no, that's fine. So there are a couple in the Q&A box. Um, would you like okay, to read them out to you? Okay. Yeah, we got some people here saying they felt these microaggressions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> You're a California snowflake, Marissa? <laughs> Give us a spelling of the culture. Oh, hijrash. Okay, let me type that. Uh, I don't. Do I know how to type that in? I'll type that in in the um, in the chat. Who asked for the uh, the spelling? It's H I J R A S. Okay. So it looks like in the chat um, uh -huh. we have yeah, one question. Some. How do you assess when micro becomes macro or just aggression? Can you speak to that more? Uh, so, so when um, the the macro aggression is just straight out discrimination, straight out prejudice, straight out um, acts that are actually prohibited. Um, so, but then again, you have to think about like your perception of it because just because a microaggression occurs, it doesn't mean it's illegal and it doesn't mean that it's prohibited. So. 
macro is 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 a variance is on a variance so we we have to look at you know what impact it has on your in the workplace what impact it has on your ability to do your job because if the behavior already microaggressions already microaggressions are are causing you to to uh, have diminished productivity morale all of these things once once it gets macro these are things that actually are very very visible that people can see, people well, they should be able to see and, and acknowledge and document. So um, when you move from like those little insidious comments to something where there's actually like um, a behavior that is documentable, that is you know demonstrable, then you you're moving into the macro. And I would definitely have a conversation with HR on that one. Looks like they're flooding in. Okay, what suggestions do you have? Uh, when you observe a microaggression between two other people, you don't know if someone was hurt, but could have been. Okay, so this here interestingly happens often uh, because people who are on the, um, the the less powerful rung of the hierarchy, uh, you know, strata, they are usually afraid to have the conversation. Says, hey, you know what you said really bothered me. So if you are a person of privilege or a person who considers yourself an ally, then it could be something as easy as walking up and say, hey, you know, what are you guys talking about? And just kind of inserting yourself um, so that that it, it kind of, first of all, it, it truncates the conversation like, okay, we have, I'm going to stop now, whoever the perpetrator is. And then once you interrupt it, you know, find a way to bring that, um, the re recipient or the victim um, away and say, hey, you know, did you want me to say something? I heard what they said, you know, are you, are you cool? You know, and just have that conversation because it really is going to be determined by the victim. Uh, although if you're hearing things that are, um, that would be considered negative or, you know, racist or uh, misogynistic or anything like that, I, I would just report it. I mean, I would just report it and just like do it as an anonymous situation or um, without naming the victim if they don't want to be named. Because that, if they're doing it to the victim, they're doing it to other people. It's, it's, it's you know, pervasive behavior. Okay. What, okay. What if you are called racist words as an educator in your classroom? <laughs> Hello, been there. Um, so one of the things that um, happens there is in the classroom, you, there's a power structure. So we are expected as professors to actually uh, be able to maintain our posture, maintain you know, our sense of self and maintain the, the classroom, regardless of what students are, are calling us or whatever. I, I would actually speak with my supervisor, my superiors and say, you know, I have a hostile environment with one of my students and, um, and it is dis it's disrupting my classroom and I, you know, I, I would like, you know, some counsel on that uh, because no one should have to work in a hostile work environment, regardless of if it is you, you have the power um, in that particular environment. And I mean, let's be real, the students, honestly, they have just about as much power as you do because they can, um, they can cause you to be reassigned. They can, you know, they can, you know, file all kinds of things on you. So uh, you might want to uh, be the person to report the issue. Okay, let me see here. Uh, what is a good way to manage fragility and minimize further harm when addressing workplace microaggression? Well, yeah, fragility, fragility is interesting because normally what ends up happening when someone who's fragile, um, they commit a microaggression, they become, they're like, oh, well, no, you know, I didn't mean that at all. You know, I'm, I'm an ally, I, you know? And so now it's the gaslighting, right? So it's not what you think it is. It's, you know, you're totally misreading it. Um, and, and it depends on the person, it depends on that person's personality. So you, you may have to have a, a conversation with that person initially and say, hey, you know what? Th this is what you said. This is how it's interpreted. Uh, you said that you did not mean this, but this is how it was interpreted. Going forward, I would appreciate it if you tried you know, your utmost best not to X, whatever it was. Um, and then you watch it. And, and you document it. And you know, if it happens again, then you have that, you, you have the conversation with the appropriate people. Because 
the, the fragility part is going to come to bite you in the bum afterwards. Because if you don't start documenting and reporting, it's now going to seem as though you're, you're the aggressor and you don't want that. Okay. A common defensive microaggression response is to pull up the dictionary. <laughs> That's not what I meant without the, okay. Yes, it is so true, right? Okay, so they're trying to like break down your argument. But the interesting thing is, is that like when you, um, it's not what you intend, it's what was actually, you know, messaged and, and, and how it was uh, received. Um, and people know. I mean, anybody who pulls up the dictionary, trust me, they know. That's not a battle that you should waste your time fighting, okay? All right. Okay. Sometimes a desire for urgency provokes fragility. Yeah. When you say ca um, casual among friends, because if I wasn't close with the person saying I shut down. Yes. Yeah. You definitely have to have, uh, when, when you're having that conversation, and it's really interesting because when people are, when you experience a microaggression, when you experience a microaggression and the perpetrator is not someone who's close to you or someone who even cares about you, that's a that's the time for you to make the decision. Do I really want to address this? Because what difference truly is it going to make with somebody who you don't have a relationship with, with someone who you're never going to see again? What difference does it make, right? But if normally what you, the, the people who you really want to have that conversation with, the people who you're going to be coming in contact with on a regular basis, i.e., you know, your coworkers, uh, your family members, and our family members do it a lot, a lot. They do it. So, so yeah, you definitely want to um, pick your battles on that one. Um, okay, let's see here. Yeah, the gas line for sure. I work in mental health and I, uh, this is Christine. I often hear employees make inappropriate comments. Yes, yes. Um, right. So there is, um, there are challenges in, in, especially in like um, certain areas of our healthcare system where, um, the concept of, of equity and inclusion is completely lost. This guy's crazy. He's a lunatic. He's da da da. These are words that um, are embedded based on, we, we talked about the historical component as to why a lot of these things um, have occurred and how they evolved. The people who you are dealing with, Christine, they have not, they have not uh, looked at their patients as people who are experiencing these things as human, right? They are, they are a, a label. They are what their constructs have told them that these people historically are. So they're not even speaking from a place of like, oh, I don't like this person. They're speaking literally from a historical perspective of what they've always been taught these people are. So it, 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 it takes training. It, I mean, it, it literally takes training. It takes it takes education, but it also takes somebody who understands how to communicate with these particular groups. Um, and especially people who are in a privileged situation who have never had to uh, undergo any type of um, treatment in, in that way. Now, often when we have women who are using these types of terminologies and you know negative whatever, we can say, hey, you know what? When somebody speaks about a woman in this way, how do you feel? Like really, like, so you kind of take like maybe an empathetic approach, maybe, but you know, it, it's, it, it, it depends on who you're talking to. Are they receptive? You know, are they receptive? So um, your, your approach has to be customized. It definitely has to be customized, uh, Christine. Let's see. Um, I find apologies not that effective. We teach saying sorry, <laughs> sorry is often not full of integrity. Nonviolent communication practices empathy as an effective response to microaggression. Yeah, but when we want to talk about an empathetic approach, and this is from Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Um, when we want to talk about an empathetic approach, um, if we combine um, like critical race theory to any component of um, of our protected classes we see that sometimes taking the empathetic route doesn't necessarily um, fix their belief and their approach to people who they deem to be less worthy. So I can empathize with you, but that doesn't necessarily change my behavior because I have to continually remember that, oh yeah, this person is 
um, you know, historically, the inequities that have happened have caused this these groups of people to be, you know, somewhere. Oh, yeah, okay, you, you're, your aggressors should use empathy. Yeah, they should, but newsflash. <laughs> I think we know, I think we know. Um, but yeah, empathy, empathy can work depending on the personality and also depending on um, the society in which we're in or, or the community that that person is regularly in. Because what happens is we leave that situation where we've committed a microaggression. Somebody's called us on it. We're like, oh my gosh, you know what? You're right. You're so right. I shouldn't have done that. I know that these people historically have been marginalized because of blah, 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 blah. Okay. An hour later, I'm at home and my spouse is spouting off all kinds of stuff. And I'm trying to figure out, okay, do I have that conversation? Is it really worth it? Or, okay, so I'll speak to him. Hey, you know, that's really not cool. I mean, where did you get all that, right? So I'm having that conversation with my family. But then I go to church. And then the people in my church are saying that too, right? So they're affirming a lot of these microaggressive behaviors. And then I go to the grocery store. And the, gro the people at the grocery store are doing the same thing. So I have this one disaffirming experience, but then the rest of my, you know, ex, uh, experience and, and, and the rest of my lived um, interactions are reaffirming, you know, the discrimination and the prejudices that I harbor. So that's the battle that you fight. That's the battle that you fight when you're talking about empathy, because empathy is not like a longitudinal experience. Um, how can I handle microaggressions that come from someone that has authority over you, like say a boss or even an older relative? So the older relative is probably easier than the boss. So the older relative, they love you, okay? They love you. You have to approach it from that perspective. You know what? Um, Auntie Jenny, you know, she's always been there for me, um, but she kind of has a deficit perception of who I am and, and you know, whatever. It's just kind of telling a story and saying, you know, Aunt Jenny, I was down at the corner store the other day and I saw, I mean, you could even make up the story, really, she doesn't know. And just reiterate um, a literal step-by-step um, -step story, basically um, imitating what she just did to you. And then you say, can you believe that someone would do that to somebody that they love? And Aunt Jenny's gonna be like, oh my gosh, no way, that's horrible. And then you just break it down. Well, you know, that's how I've been really feeling when you say these things to me. That opens up another conversation. But you have to approach it from like love. Not, hey, Aunt Jenny, I'm sick of your boop, boop, boop. I'm sick of, you know, none of that. Just approach it from a place of love and, and, and just really, you know, approach her or him with how you would want to be approached if you were getting called on something, right? The boss, the boss is a whole nother situation. That's all money, right? That's all money because it's productivity. Hey, when you say these things, you know what? That really causes me to need a day off. What does that do? That reduces my productivity. That reduces the output. That reduces the morale. Let's talk about how we can, you know, nip this in the bud because hmm, it's not really going down well. Now the boss could say one thing or another. They could say, well, if you don't like it, you can get out of here. And then that's your decision to make. Or the boss could say, well, what do you mean? Have those backup examples for what you mean and the impact that it caused. And then attach that to your work product. Because I mean, bosses are great, but the reality is, is the bottom line, right? Okay. Oh, okay. So Karen said, um, the question is, I grew up all over the world and frequently use to ask new people I was meeting where they come from because I lived in so many different countries. Yes, I was told that that is a microaggression and not a joining technique. Yes, okay, so it could be. Um, we see a lot of um, Asian Americans having this situation, right? So it's like, where are you from? Oh, I, you know, I'm from the Bay Area. No, 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 but where are you really from? And that is, uh, uh, that, that's a really insidious way. Uh, people feel, feel microaggressed when you do that because what it says is it, it others them. It makes them feel as though they're not an American. Um, and what you just did was really, really great. Hey, you know, I grew up all over the world. I've seen so many, you know, different people and interacted. Um, you know, I, that's really what I meant. Like if you ask that question and somebody gets offended, you could just 
you know, drop that explanation. Well, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a nomad and, and I, I, I love meeting people from different places, you know, um, and did I luck out today uh, and, and, and see, you know, what that does. Okay. All right. Yes, Karen, that's, that's great. Yeah. Um, okay. So I think we may have covered all of the questions. I think so. I hope so. Let's see. It makes me very anxious to meet people and offend them without knowing, okay, that was an anonymous attendee. So you avoid situations where you meet people. Oh, okay, that's not good. We want you to meet people. Okay, who else, anyone? Oh, yes. Microaggression is different from harassment or bullying because microaggression is not something that can act that's actually, you know, in a legal policy. It's not in the HR policy. It's, it's, there is, it's not illegal. There's nothing in um, our uh, legal, you know, our legislature, whatever, that talks about microaggression. Why microaggression is bad is because you, uh, it, it impacts, and we saw all the impact, right? It, 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 the combination of everyday experiences and exposure to this behavior causes, it's like chipping away at a rock. And then people have mental health issues, depression. They can't work. They don't want to be around other people. Um, and so th this is why it is. Um, okay. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a question. It was more of a comment about races. I, okay. I'm Black, Mexican, and a lesbian, so I get these microaggressions at all levels. Yes, yes. Okay, Black, yeah, you go, girl. Uh-huh, yeah. Oh, you're Mexican, can tell. And your customers are lesbian. Oh, my gosh, yes. Don't you just love it, Tamika? Don't you just love it? I mean, people can be so creative in their microaggressions. Um, yeah, and, and it's an understanding. Like, so why did you snap? Why did you say you go, girl, when, you know, you thought I was... Did you think that that's how black women, you know, is, is, is very interesting how you and how you approach it is based on your relationship with the person, you know, is it even worth it half of the time? Um, but for those uh, with whom it's worth, then you have those conversations and you let them know that this is, this is not okay. Um, and I think that that intersectionality that you have gives you a really, really great bird's eye view to what, what could, um, the, how, how you could articulate the way microaggressions impact you. And, and you could be really um, a great mentor for others who are experiencing that, so. All right, so let's see. Matt says, what are some ways besides recommending everyone watch this seminar, thank you Matt, um, that white people can see guidance from black or African-American people or other people of color about how to talk about race in the workplace or in our communities for that matter without committing microaggression in the first place. Well, um, I, I, I do teach on um, uh, race, racism and anti-racism. And uh, th there are really interesting concepts on how, how we look at race um, as a social construct. Uh, because like I said, it's not, um, you know, it's not, has no biological meaning. So uh, there, are, there are several ways to have that conversation. But what I think it needs to be based in is the origin of it. Like, why do we believe that people who look like this act like this? Where did all that come from? And so that's, that's a great way to start unpacking um, where racism comes from. And, and if you are able to understand it, then that conversation would, will, um, that conversation would move very differently. Okay. Let's see, will you please show the slide of responses to microaggression I just sent? Okay, we'll, we'll send you um, the responses. Uh, I think, I think, Monica, I think we can. <laughs> um, or, you know, I, I, I can, um, they can have my contact information if, if at all need be, and I can definitely do that. Dr. Seal will be teaching a course. Okay, yeah, that's right. Da, 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 da. Oh, ha. Antonia. How would you address a problem in the workplace where it's assumed the women only answer the phones? Oh, the housework that we, you know, the housework that we go through in the job. Um, well, that assumption, that assumption once again is based, of course, you know, in the, you know, what, what women do and whatnot. So there, there are conversations to be had. There are conversations to be had and then there are decisions to be made. 
um, unless a person wants to change their perspective, they're not going to. My mom always says, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. So if you're able to have the conversation and say, hey, you know what? What we're looking at is, is, is um, an environment that is actually hostile toward women. We're expected to do this only. Um, is there a reason why? I mean, do you have like a policy in your whatever that says only women answer the phones or is this a preference? Is this a principle or a preference? And then you can have that conversation, Antonia. Um, because if it's your boss's preference, then that's, you know, then, you know, there's some flexibility there. If it's not, if it's policy, is this the workplace you want to be in? You know, so you may want to consider that. Okay. I think we're good. Sorry, Christine. I'm really glad that you found it informative and helpful. I enjoyed it.